The Master and the Margarita by Mikhail Bulgakov. I read a couple years ago, um, so it's a little hazy, and but I think it's probably one of my all-time favorite books. Um, I don't know that I probably top that list with a t ton of different things. Um, lots of obviously lots of Hesse probably comes up, Dostoevsky, Kafka. So it's kind of hard to say that was one. But I, if you had to choose, probably my top fifteen, maybe top ten. I probably put it up there. Um, I think uh, there's a part of me that kind of wants to love it for the allure of the magic realism kind of aspect, and there is it is kind of up there, you know, like Daniel Radcliffe. I think not for just for the reason that he read it, but kind of like um, it come, shows up as kind of like oh, like all these kind of you know a famous person here and there kind of reads it, <laughs> and it kind of gives it a little bit more of a uh, this uh, regaling kind of you know uh, enticing look to it, but I think um, I don't want to sell it short for that. You know, I don't want to cheapen it, but I did genuinely enjoy this book, and um, despite there being some problems here and there, it's not you know obviously no book is perfect, obviously, um, but it is a 1940s book and it has a very interesting I think. Was published in the was it in early forties, but it took a while to get published because Bulgakov was under Soviet Union, obviously, and he couldn't get it. Um, you know, it was kind of uh, Sam as dad, I think, is the term. It was something that was like very uh, hard to you know find a publisher that would be willing to say things that would you know publish anything, even overtly. I'm sorry, no, covertly, uh, just implicitly anything against. Uh, anti-Stalin would have been thrown in the dustbin and just look at Schultz and Nitzen and, you know, the couple of videos I think I did on him, I go further detail into that. Um, you know, not to say that I've totally, uh, you know, brushed up on the history of that and, uh, or went totally de on down the rabbit hole of that, but it, it is very fascinating. I find that the fact that it actually, you know, the, the whole, um, kind of a motif, or I guess light, late motif, that appears again and again in the novel is manuscripts don't burn, uh, or manuscripts cannot burn, uh, which is uttered again uh, by uh, the main character of the master, and also of uh, Woden, I think, and uh, Wolin, I think, yeah, um, and which is kind of true, holds true for the fact that um, and this is some of the criticism some people take, like, well, is it manuscripts don't burn? It's like, well, I mean, in, figuratively speaking, like, you think about the the trouble it takes, you know, f like, all the trouble it takes to kind of burn somebody's manuscript. It's like the fact that there's a lot of very high-profile authors that strongly considered burning, you know, all their first drugs. Like, you know, this is way before computers, way before you could back it up on a on a uh, hard drive or anything like that, or in the cloud nowadays. And um, yeah, so there's a lot of uh, trouble getting that solidified and, and, and when people burn it, it's really gone for good, you know? And um, it's kind of the trope, you know, that that people show a lot, like the fact that, well, art, you know, it, it perseveres for the art's sake. It doesn't actually, nobody's, you know, nobody's gonna come along and just because it, you know, even, someone burning it, this uh, this great uh, work of art masterpiece doesn't actually negate the spirit put into it. Like, it lives it lives on. Just something to be said about, like, orally done. Um, you know, orally brought on stories. And that's what uh, kind of makes me fascinated even more is the fact that, like, you know, something living in, I guess, platonic perfect forms, I guess if you want to get philosophical, actually, you know, like that it doesn't actually have to exist in a material form for it to actually be valid, I think. Um, it depends on your philosophy, again. There's a lot of people who shake Plato off and say, it's like, oh, it's a lot of bunk. But anyway, so as that aside, um, Master and Margarita, not Master and Margarita, and the Margarita. It's uh, um, about a young man, um, well, I think young in the beginning of the story, and he starts writing this, uh, the plot details are a little messy, or for me, recalling it, um, you know, because I don't have the best of memory, <laughs> uh, if that's not obvious enough. Um, so it's about a young man who is nicknamed the master, he's just going to refer to him as the master, and he's basically um, writing this book, writing this uh, 
you know the namesake of this you know the uh masterwork of his uh that he spent so much of his life working on and then his love margarita this is kind of like the kind of main thread of the plot line but you also start way back it actually starts with a kind of cold opening uh like 2000 bc with jesus christ and then i think Pontius Pilate and the whole crucifixion of christ i think is kind of retelling it but it's kind of an alternate history i believe and this is where it gets hazy because i actually don't remember what happens with that it, i want to say that timeline is kind of running parallel to the rest of this and like when bulgakov is using it kind of as a uh narrative piece i think to point out that um the timelessness of the master's work and there's and basically like pontius pilate is um I think there's an alternate thing where Jesus doesn't get crucified, kind of, like in a kind of last temptation of Christ type of thing, but I'm not entirely sure what happens there. But it does what I do remember is the fact that um the Master and the Margarita's lo their their uh his lover, the Mar called Margarita, they're uh kind of in a rut and they, like she, he's um you know, there's uh like they love each other but they can't it's that kind of classic unrequited, not unrequited love, but it's kind of this love, tragic love, I think. You know, like they both, they can, for most of the novel, it's like they're kind of separated from one another, I think. And they don't actually get to fully realize this love that has been building up in this, you know, tragic, just, uh, long suffering type of love that's been swelling up in both of them for, you know, so many years. And then they finally get to at the net end of the novel. Uh, but uh, that will be for a later time um further down the road and so but then the other thing that's going on uh is that the devil visit starts to visit saint petersburg and this is where things get really kooky um and kind of phantasmagoric is uh woden i think or wolan i think is basically um a stand-in kind of name for the devil and he shows up and then starts performing miracles and then people go mad there's uh, one guy named Homeless, Ivan the Homeless, I think. He's, I think. In fact, I think he just calls him throughout the novel. I think it's just Ivan Homeless or something like that. Um, maybe just to make the kind of Russian names a little bit less. <laughs> you're like, oh, well, it's like some convoluted Russian last name. But um, yeah, he sees him and then he goes almost stark mad. And um, that's the, the tragedy of this is also the, or the comic, I want to say the comicality is like, it's tragic comic, I think in the sense that characters are so, you know, just, like, in shock. It's just alarming, the fact that, like, a devil would show up in St. Petersburg, and, you know, in Moscow, I think, or St. Petersburg, and uh, be performing tricks and miracles and all that. Well, not miracles, I'd say, like, actually, kind of the inverse of miracles. And um, I, I get the sense from that, because... Um, um, there's also a very funny talking cat named uh, Behemoth that shows up too. That's like very witty and very um, <laughs> kind of uh, invasive too. Just like very, um, I get the sense from the devil in this that he is a, a bit of a uh, just like uh, John Milton's Paradise Lost. That very variety of devil where he's, you know, it's better to reign in. Uh, better to reign in uh, hell than to serve in heaven. That type of kind of reverse, uh, I don't want to call it reverse psychology, but kind of a reverse morality um, or a kind of a relative, I think, or perspectivism, I think is like the philosophical term as well, is that morality is kind of, you know, like good and evil aren't these set terms. And in fact, there's actually a very wonderful quote from the novel that he says something to the effect of like you you call things evil but you don't really you know like you don't like just because you don't understand them or something to that uh effect um and it's like kind of brings up a theme of the fact that evil is seen as something that's just all it is is just mysterious like the fact something's esoteric the fact the second somebody gets something gets convoluted and abstract people start to fear it and just kind of you know like oh write it off as evil and you know and that's kind of what Woden showing up like in fact a lot of the times he doesn't actually do anything all that he he does things that are uh bizarre and but he never i don't think he ever does anything that's 
well, yeah, he does like make somebody like goes dark mad, but yeah, aside from that, I don't think he ever really like goes in with a sword, you know, killing people or doing. And uh, but then again, I don't think it, even the Christian variety of the devil quite does that either. The devil works in kind of you know mysterious ways and uses trickery and subterfuge. So I guess that could be a drawing a parallel there. But I think I like the um what's the word ambivalence of this novel it's not making any grand uh brush strokes moral you know with it um so yeah um uh so basically at this point uh master and the Mar margarita are trying to uh you know while the devil's kind of roaming around and uh causing a ruckus uh the, um along with a cat behemoth that shows up and also is like there's a part where he goes like on the train i think you know he's like uses and people are like oh my gosh a talking cat going on a train and you know i thought that was kind of funny um and yeah while that's happening i think like you know the master is like in is like actually in a prison and um he's trying to escape you know he's trying to and he's like actually for kind of wrongful reasons and i think this also uh reflects a lot of like bulgakov's own uh, life experiences as well, and the fact that he um, waited so long to be able to actually get you know his books published, he had to like struggle with the Soviet Union and and uh, kind of under this menacing Stalinist regime, he uh, um, uh, also I think there's a you know he had one of the meetings that he was in I think he he had, there was this. Uh, odd meeting that he had to attend that was in this uh this very kind of uh regal looking hall but i think it was all but it was so like absurd i think like the reasons and like he had to and it was so restricting and concerned like he had to um i'm not entirely sure what happened but i think it would, had to do something with the fact that um it was like some type of censorship to you know meeting that he had to do and that kind of influenced this novel as well because of the the many type of uh, uh the trope of the magic realism is that there's very freaky wacky things happening and nobody acts like anything's changed i think because it is a that's the way i think of it um or maybe i'm not entirely correct in that um you know like a lot of it is um you'll see tropes uh of it define it as kind of like magic realism being um something like it taking place in the mundane but it's like you know something freaky starkly c contrast against the mundane yet being treated as if it's just like everything else you know like the quotidian array of everything else you see so that's kind of what happens a lot in this novel is that um woden uh antics are kind of you know uh people kind of just write them off either that or you know like the, i think like the doctor that you know he's treating ivan homeless after he goes mad is like saying like you're just having delusions like you're just so and that's definitely kafka asking in a way and yeah um drawing a blank on how exactly it ends but like finally the bastion and the you know margarita finally end up together and you know finally uh get to def you know it, and i think it's been like almost a, you're over a decade i think right i think uh in that he's been in confinement and um so yeah the, and i think you know they, they rein in that manuscripts don't burn i think again near the end of the novel kind of just to rein in that his masterpiece that he's been writing which now that i think about it actually i think yeah don't uh don't quote me on this but i think like his the whole thing with Jesus and Pontius Pilate, 2000 BC. I think that all takes place. That's actually the master's novel, I think, and he's writing in that, and it's like, and that's actually taking place parallel to this story, and you know his own story of like trying to get free and you know meet back up with his love, Margarita, and uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, Master and the Margarita by Bulgakov, interesting book. Um, definitely do for a reread. Um, there's also some other stuff of his that I've, uh, I've only read one, one of his other books and it's called The Young Doctor's Notebook. Um, I think I wrote that well before The Master and the Margarita.
that was when he was in, starting to become a medical professional, and which obviously he didn't totally kind of reminded me of Chekhov too. Like Chekhov, you know, he was a medical professional first, and then an author, and then slash dramatist and playwright. And yeah, it was uh, really interesting. It was actually um, that was a lot less magically realistic, I think, and it was a lot less fantasia, you know, um, phantasm going on. But it was pretty interesting. It was a lot kind of starkly realistic at times and kind of deal detailing the um I'll have to review the whole thing, but you know, it's kind of detailing his struggles to, you know, in healing people and, you know, like um, you know, the the limitations at the time. Like to think of like the medical or, you know, that whole industry that's just popped, you know, like in the you know, it's just like grown it's just such a far cry of what it used to be. Um, it was kind of weird in the dark ages not too long ago to think. So, yeah, um, let me know what you think, and I'll catch you on the next one.